Hello, beautiful people. My name is Kira, aka Words by Kira, and today we have a really special episode. We have the amazing Dr. Karen Gaffney, and she is a professor, writer, and also an activist. She does a lot of work fighting against racism, and we're going to really dive in and see about her experiences. So if you're interested, then keep on watching. So Karen, thank you so much for joining today. I've been really excited about this conversation. And I just wanted to give some of the viewers who might be new to you just a little insight. Like I know that you're a professor at RVCC, you teach English and also race and gender. So what originally made you want to become an English professor? Sure. Well, thank you so much, Kara, for the opportunity. I really appreciate being here and being in conversation with you. I I didn't always want to be an English professor, but I always knew that I loved to read. I think that was one of my one of my early passions, and that was something that always um, stayed with me. I might not have been super excited about what I was reading in school, in middle school and high school, but um, I certainly loved reading on my own and really just appreciated how much reading, you know, stories and novels allowed you to kind of imagine a world. And so I guess for me, the, my love of reading really stuck with me. And eventually, I decided to, you know, to go to graduate school in, in English. And so I did my master's and PhD in English. And ultimately, I uh, really focused on um, teaching at a community college. And so I just finished my 17th year teaching at Raritan Valley Community College. And I love it. Um, I really enjoy teaching writing. I think it's also really important to help people develop their voice, develop their ability to communicate their points. And so I really appreciate being able to, you know, try to share my love of reading with students, but also to help students um, develop more confidence in their writing and to develop their, their own voice. I'm an avid reader as well. I love reading. From the time I was young, I would read all the time. And you know the movie Matilda? Mm -hmm. <laughs> I literally, I mean, thank God I, I have good parents. Thank you. But <laughs> thank you, God. But I really related so much to Matilda. She was just always reading. And I think that's really important. I know you also teach about race and gender. So how did you decide? What made you want to gravitate to that type of classes? Sure. So that was actually the focus of much of my graduate work in English. And so at a community college, when you teach English, usually you're teaching mostly uh, composition because that's what everybody needs to take. We require two levels, English one and English two. So that's um, the bulk of my teaching load. But then we also offer a variety of electives. And so I teach a class called Women in Literature. Um, and I teach that every so often. And that's a literature elective. And I love teaching that because I really get to share the sorts of novels that I really think are so important. Um, one of my favorite writers is Toni Morrison. And I think um, it's really important to include her work. It was so, it was so sad um, with her passing last year. And that sort of helped me think more about really making sure I'm including her, her work in my courses. And so in women in literature, I'll often assign the bluest eye. Um, I recently started assigning work by Celeste Ng, who I've really enjoyed a lot. So I've assigned um, Everything I Never Told You. She also did Little Fires Everywhere, which was a recent um, Hulu series, which I thought was really, really fascinating. Um, I also love working with students on Alison Bechdel's graphic novel called Fun Home, which I think is really, um, really important. And uh, Angie Thomas's The Hate You Give, which is a really, really powerful novel that actually I've assigned in several different classes. But I think, you know, in terms of teaching about gender, I think it's really important for students to understand uh, the ways in which um, gender impacts um, all of us. And to be able to understand, you know, some of the history of feminism. There's a great documentary, She's Beautiful When She's Angry, that I love to assign and connect to some of the literature and, you know, to really um, help students understand what sorts of messages we get about, about our gender role and what, you know, what we're supposed to be and how we also resist that in the context of, 
um, fighting oppression and patriarchy. And so I've been really inspired by so many women writers, especially women writers of color, black feminists. I was really um, in grad school inspired by the work of uh, Gloria Anzaldúa and um, her anthology, This Bridge Called My Back. And so I try to pass that along to students as well in different sorts of excerpts. So I think just sort of sharing the ways in which women from various backgrounds have been writing about gender, writing about our experiences so that students can develop a fuller understanding, raise their awareness, raise their consciousness. And then when it comes to race, I think, I mean, everything is inter, you know, intersectional and it's really important to be able to um, look at uh, multiple categories and multiple ways in which we, you know, people are labeled and um, categorized and positioned into various social hierarchies. I, I developed a class um, about 15 years ago at RVCC based on my graduate work called Race in American Literature and Popular Culture. And so I teach that usually about once a year. And so that's a combination of both um, some novels. I, I often teach Toni Morrison's Beloved in that class. And I lately have also been teaching The Hate You Give in that as well, just because it works so well. But really, I often teach um, excerpts from my own book, Dismantling the Racism Machine, just to sort of give students a framework for understanding how race has been constructed in the United States and how literature responds to that, navigates that, and what literature can, you know, can do for us when it comes to liberation. Yes. I think it's so important because I know for me, and I'm sure you hear it all the time, Karen, that I didn't really learn about these things in school. It was just racism or slavery, I should really say slavery. Then you guys got freed and now... (laughs) You know, let's just all try to be successful and work together. But just like you said, it's about navigating that. And gender, I did actually, I did have a women's studies class in high school. Shout out um, my teacher, Miss Kennedy. That was a really excellent class, but that was all the way up to high school. And even within that class, there was a lot of pushback from certain students and it would get really riled up, which I'm sure happens in a lot of classes, period, when you talk about really heavy material like that. But I love the fact that you're teaching these things and other teachers are as well, because it's wonderful to self-educate, but I think it's really powerful when you're learning in a group, in a class format. So I I just want to say that I really appreciate that. And I heard you mention your book, Dismantling the Racism Machine. Mm -hmm. So can you just tell us a little bit about that? What was it like working on that? And what was your mission with your book? So um, thank you for that. Uh, Yes, so my book, um, Dismantling the Racism Machine, came out about two years ago. And writing a book is hard. I'm not gonna, (laughs) I'm not gonna lie. Um, It's really hard. It's challenging. It's exciting and it's important, but it is also, it's also hard to figure out what you want to say, how to organize it. And then also just the whole um, process of getting a publisher is, is quite a challenge. And so when I finished graduate school in 2003 and started teaching at RVCC, I knew that I wanted to turn the sort of work I'd done in graduate school into a book. But what does that mean? And what does that look like that, you know, that's a pretty, usually a pretty bumpy road. And one of the things that um, I initially was doing was something that was more scholarly and it just wasn't really working. Um, And then I really, as I started to teach my class at the college and started to do some more public discussions and community workshops about these issues, I started to realize there was a really significant gap between what the scholars I had spent my time in graduate school studying, what they knew versus what the public knew. And that really started to be more and more something that I was paying attention to and realizing. And just like you said, a lot, most people don't get exposed to this sort of education in K to 12. And so the students that I had who were fresh out of high school at RVCC were often very surprised about the sorts of ideas that we were talking about that, you know, even just the basic idea of race being an invention or a social construct and not something that's biological. They, once they learned about that, they're like, well, why didn't we learn this before? They thought it was such an important idea or how systemic racism persists today. Just not having, you know, the real, the foundation of understanding um, 
you know, what that, what that really means. And so I decided to shift gears and rather than focus on writing something for other scholars, I shifted into wanting to write something that would be more for the beginner. So whether that was a college student in an introductory course or a community member who was interested in, in um, learning more about this regardless of their age. And so that's when I felt like things clicked and I was able to put this book together in a way that process, once I understood what I wanted to do, finally things came together and that, you know, that worked um, more smoothly than it had been when I was kind of bouncing around, not really sure what I was doing. Yes. I love that you shifted your idea to kind of where the need was. I feel as though with other scholars, it's great to write a scholar book, but they kind of already clearly knew what was going on. So I love the fact that you decided to pivot to the community because they needed this information. And that leads me actually to my next question for people who are trying to figure out ways that they can contribute and be solution-based with dismantling racism and other discrimination. Where do you, what do you suggest are like some good steps that they can take? Sure. So I guess the way that I think about this is sort of on two levels. One is about working essentially on yourself. And this is especially for white people where changing your mindset and developing an anti-racist mindset is extremely important. So white people in particular have been indoctrinated into false beliefs Um, or myths, or we might call it an ideology that are just simply not true about race and racism. And these uh, false beliefs are dangerous and they allow white supremacy and systemic racism to persist. So one of the things that I really emphasize, you know, like I said, especially with white people is to work on developing, you know, what Ibram Kendi might call your your anti-racist mindset, where you're starting to identify how you've been indoctrinated into these false beliefs. And as you become more aware of that, the ways in which you've been indoctrinated, then you can start to what I call unindoctrinate yourself or what one of the people that I spoke with recently said um, to deprogram yourself. And so that is, especially for white people, a lifelong process. Um, I've been working on this for 20 years, and I am certainly nowhere near to being finished. This is a lifelong process. It never ends. We're always learning um, and always growing in our awareness about how, how much we've been indoctrinated. And so that's one level for me, this developing your um, anti-racist mindset. Uh, another level then is to apply that anti-racist mindset. So there have been, you know, a bunch of articles coming out recently and blog posts and comments and Twitter that if people are only reading about racism, then nothing really is going to change. I mean, yes, education is important and you don't want action and activism without a foundation in in education. But if you only are focusing on your mindset and not applying it, then things won't change. So in addition to developing that anti-racist mindset, I really urge people to then apply it. And if people are new to um, this sort of work, then I'm sure they feel you know, overwhelmed and intimidated and they don't need to invent something out you know, from scratch. There are so many organizations that are already doing such important work um, who are asking for people to, to do specific actions. And so at the national level, visiting the Black Lives Matter website, as well as the the website for the Movement for Black Lives, which is a coalition of groups, they have very specific action items and campaigns that people can join up for, uh, join up, you know, to to work on um, so they can learn more about these sorts of things. The um, national organization Color of Change also uh, provide some really valuable action items for people. So again, they don't have to try to figure this out on their own. And then for people in New Jersey, I really you know, recommend the, the action and activism of the New Jersey Institute for Social Justice. 
Uh, they have several campaigns that really need public support. And so I think of that as sort of a, a way to get involved. You don't have to invent all of this. You don't have to try to figure this out on your own. You can start doing the work that is being asked. And then as you, as you start to do that sort of work, then it will broaden your network. And I mean, obviously in a pandemic, activism is more challenging um, to do in-person meetings and um, in-person planning sessions. But, you know, we have various kinds of technology to be able to do that. And um, if people are wearing masks and being careful in protest, that's also really, um, I think, really effective. So again, I think it's important to develop your anti-racist mindset and um, education, I believe, is part of that. And then to apply that anti-racist mindset. Thank you for sharing all those resources. I'm going to put all of them in the description <laughs> box so that people are able to access them. Thank you so much for sharing those. And you're absolutely right. I know it can be daunting sometimes because there are a lot of different issues. We're trying to get a more equitable society. And I think sometimes it can feel like, oh my gosh, these are so huge. What can I do? I'm just a small person. But one person can make a lot of change, especially when we all come together. So thank you for sharing those with us. Also, just to give a little context, I met Karen at a protest for Black Lives Matter. And I was very, very impressed with your speech. And I wanted to ask you, what has it been like speaking at these type of spaces, protest conferences about racism and white privilege? What, what has it been like for you? Um, I think, well, first of all, I really appreciated being invited to speak at multiple Black Lives Matter protests in my own town. And so that, that was very meaningful to me. And especially to be invited back after the first time I spoke, that I really appreciated that a lot. And so I, I certainly want to acknowledge that. I think for me, speaking to a group, whether it is in the context of a protest or at a conference, I mean, obviously these situations are, you know, a bit different, but I think, you know, in a lot of ways it's humbling because um, as a white person, I will never know what it's like to experience racism firsthand. And I am so appreciative when Black people, people of color are sharing and being so generous with, with the audience about the sorts of experiences that they've had to really, you know, put themselves out there is I really have been so appreciative of that. I know that I'm always learning and always growing and I want to do what I can, you know, to make a contribution as a white person. I um, didn't obviously create racism. Um, it has been here for centuries, but as a white person, I benefit from it. And I didn't understand that growing up. I don't think most pe white people do understand that growing up. And so once I started to really understand that, then I, you know, obviously I have a responsibility to do something. And so being able to speak out um, to help support the Black Lives Matter movement, to help work with audiences and conferences, you know, that are often in a more academic setting. You know, I think that's, that's really important because I want to be able um, to do what I can to create change. I want to say, I love your responses about us being generous and speaking to people because I think people need to hear from all different sides, men, women, different races, different creeds, because I think this is a problem that affects us all in so many different ways. And in order for us to be able to improve it on those different sides, we have to hear from different perspectives in my opinion. Was there anything else you wanted me to ask you or any other thing you wanted to talk about? The only other real point I wanted to bring is just uh, how important it is to, sit, to stay sustained in this work. Um, I've noticed every time um, over the past several years, there's you know, uh, an event that gets especially white people's attention. They read more about it. They even join some protests. Um, there's sort of a flurry of activity. Um, they want to do something immediately. 
Um, and then that kind of fades away after a few weeks. And I want this to be different. We need this to be different. We need people to be sustained in this work. It can't just fizzle out. Uh, we have to be able to tackle systemic racism once and for all. And that takes sustained work in the movement without saying, you know, I'm done. <laughs> you know, that was my summer project. And now, um, and now I'm done. So I really want people to, to stay sustained and not um, to just, you know, it's so easy, I think, for white people to, to just um, say, well, I, I checked that box, I did that, I went to these three protests, I watched these webinars, and, you know, I'm done. But that's, I don't think that's an option anymore. I completely agree. And thank you for sharing that message because you're right. I even see it now when the protests first started, there were hundreds of people and some even in very small towns that I've never seen them have protests before. But as things start opening up, it's summertime, the numbers are getting lower and lower. And I'm not saying that everyone has to make a difference by attending protests. There are multiple ways to make a contribution like working with those organizations that you named or mm -hmm. having a tough conversation with someone or showing up and speaking out against it. Like, no, this is wrong and, and taking a stand. But the most important thing that you mentioned is staying sustained. We can't get tired. You know, I think it's, it, sometimes you have to take a break. You can't just mm -hmm. go, 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 but you need to get up after your break and you need to keep doing the work. So thank you for mentioning that. Because I, I think already conversations about it are, I don't want to say dwindling down, but it's not like how it was in, in the April. I believe that's mm -hmm. when they, they kind of started mm -hmm. with the protests. But yeah, that's an excellent point to make. I know about your Divided No Longer platform. I think that it's incredibly important. But for people that aren't familiar with it, what is Divided No Longer and what made you come up with this platform? Sure. Thank you for that question. So I created the website DividedNoLonger.com. Um, about, I think it's been six years at this point. And so part of it was a way for me to share resources that I thought were really important in order to get the message out to the public about just sort of basic ideas about race and racism that I felt like were not getting out there. So it was before my book came out and it was really probably my first attempt to do something digitally that would, you know, provide anyone who was interested with links to videos or articles and my occasional blog, not, not that frequent, but occasional with my own thoughts um, on these issues. And so I, like I said before, I worry that, you know, that students in K to 12 schools are often not learning really basic ideas about race and racism, and that adults, especially white adults, are not really aware of these sorts of things, um, unless they've really spent some time, you know, in this work. And so I wanted to provide a platform that I could update frequently, that included information about general resources and history, but then also I created um, as things evolved over the past several years, I created uh, specific pages on resources about certain topics within race and racism. So over the past um, few months, I created a page specifically about when the pandemic hit, how the, you know, how the coronavirus was revealing white supremacy even more. And then after George Floyd's murder, I created a page on policing and racism in order to provide resources both about the history and also about um, action items and groups that are working for change just to try to have you know, one place that people could go to that I could keep adding to. I mean, that's the beauty of it is unlike a book, you can just keep adding to a website and keep updating it. And so that's one of the things that I have found really helpful if I'm you know, talking to somebody or giving a presentation, I can just say, you know, just go to this page. And also when I give public workshops, I'm about to wrap up a series uh, sponsored by the Summit Public Library, where we've been meeting for four Fridays. And I created a page on my website for them. I mean, anyone can access it, but it just has resources specific to the topic of each week. And so 
um, they can, if they want to, you know, follow up and look at some additional resources. So it's, you know, I'm not honestly, a very good with technology. So um, it was a little scary to, to go in this direction. I'm also trying to uh, get better about Twitter. And it's so funny because for, for somebody who's studied English for so long, <laughs> trying to write in such short spurts is still a challenge. And um, that makes me feel old. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> but uh, uh, so I'm, I'm working on that. But I do have... Um, uh, I, I am on Twitter at divided no longer as well. But I think for me, it's just another way to try to help people have access to what they didn't learn, to access to action items, um, information about organizations and activists. I often meet all kinds of uh, great people at conferences, and then I'll add their platforms to mine to try to you know, expand things out. So I do think that that's, it's important to be able to use this sort of technology to work towards liberation, when obviously this sort of technology is also at the same time being used in the opposite direction. So I think we need to be able to take advantage of it. Absolutely. I agree, especially in a situation like this, where we can't all physically be together in the way that we used to, We can still communicate on technology. And I'm with you. I think that it's great that you're on Twitter. I used to have a Twitter. Maybe I should get back on it. It can be a little intimidating, but I'm sure you're doing a great job. And maybe I should try it again, too. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with me today and sharing your perspectives. I really appreciated it. I'm going to put Divided No Longer, your website, in the description box as well for everyone who wants to access it. And I really enjoyed speaking with you. Thank you so much. I really appreciate all you do. And I appreciate your support and your time. Thank you. Okay. (laughs) Bye. Bye.